So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Straight Science. Straight Science is a public presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus here in Nome, and also UAF Alaska Sea Grant. Again, this is the home office. Um, and UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, we serve the Bering Strait region, and we're public servants. And the Bering Strait region is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. And tonight we have Rick Toman is our straight science speaker. Rick is the Alaska Climate Specialist for the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy, lovingly known as UAF ACCAP. And uh, we're always glad to have Rick Toman. And Rick Toman was kind enough to uh, remember or think of us actually when we had this extraordinary day upon us, uh, July 1. So tonight we're gonna find out how and why we had uh, the smoky start to July, or as Rick had said, smoked Alaska, kind of like a different version of baked Alaska. Uh, I guess, Rick, you're willing to take questions at any time? Oh, of course. Okay. With that, I'll hand it over to you and thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Gay. Um, thanks everyone for um, taking, taking time out of your Thursday evening to join in. Obviously, this was a pretty um, impromptu straight science two weeks ago. Um, didn't know we were gonna be doing this, but um, really an extraordinary event for uh, Western Alaska. And I thought that um, it would be good to, to put this together um, while it's um, still reasonably fresh in people's memories, and you know, if you have uh, maybe on your coat or if you have um, uh, clothes that you were wearing that haven't been laundered yet, you might even still be able to smell um, uh, the uh, gnomes in, in Western Alaska's incredibly smoky day. And uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, what we'll do here is if we can get the technology to work. Okay, so... Um, just the what and the why. So what happened? Um, we had this incredible um, smoke event, if you will. Western Alaska was inundated by thick wildfire smoke, um, air quality hazardous to, to you know, extremely unhealthy um, for, you know, six to as long as 15 hours. And the really interesting question um, and what I, you know, what, one of the reasons I was actually excited to do this is, um, uh, is that it, it, it got me to figure out or get an idea of how could it be so smoky, so far away uh, from the fires. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that here as well. So, um, here is, here's a satellite picture from the afternoon of June 30th. Um, the fires that produced uh, all the smoke are right down here. Here's um, Lake Yeliamna, here's Dillingham, over here's King Salmon. So these fires are a long way away from uh, Norton Sound, Southern Seward Peninsula. From Nome to the fire front here, this is the red here. This isn't fake color. This is a, a false color satellite picture that's designed to bring out um, active burning fire. And so um, that's what this is here. So 430 miles from this very intense uh, fire front. Um, this started out as two separate fires. Um, uh, the Cocktooley River fire is the east, was the easternmost one. Pike Creek was uh, the Western one. Um, by this point, by June 30th, um, they had burned together. Um, but um, so really intense burning, a very long way from, um, from Western Alaska. Now here I just, this is the exact same image. I just zoomed in here a little bit so you can see some of the details here. Now this, uh, this particular false image a uh, false color image is designed, it's called, actually called the land, day land cloud fire uh, color curve. And it's designed to bring out both active fires. So that's kind of the, the fiery colors here. Along here, you can see some of these other fires up to the north um, where there's some activity, but nothing like what was going on down here. 
And then you can see as well, um, this year's burn scars as of September 30th, um, right up here, this is where uh, hopefully you can see my cursor there. Um, that's the East Fork fire um, that got very close to St. Mary's. Uh, that's the um, uh, Apun Pass fire um, that just to the Northwest there. So um, this is a very useful, um, useful curve for wildfire stuff, but it's really these fires down here, this massive fire front. This is about a 40 mile, uh, almost continuous wall of fire that was burning on the afternoon of the 30th. Really quite amazing and by far uh, the most intense fires that day in the, in the state. Now here's a graphic, um, you may have seen this on the Facebook page I put together. So by, by um, uh, basically following the, or tracking the visibility at all the FAA uh, weather stations um, along the route, I was able to track kind of the, as this dense smoke moved northwestward. And uh, the, hour, the numbers here indicate the number of hours uh, when the visibility was one mile or less. So that's air quality in the extremely unhealthy, extremely hazardous, I think they call it, uh, category. Uh, and, uh, Antioch got the, the absolute worst of it, but you can see how it spreads out here, um, moving northwest. The dashed lines are the approximate times that the visibilities drop to that one mile, so they can see the, the, uh, the time uh, progression here of this dense smoke plume. Now, I want to point out that um, this is in a fairly narrow window. Um, Kaliganuk, right close to the fire, um, the winds were blowing the smoke away from, from town. They didn't have any uh, appreciable smoke from this. Same at Bethel, no appreciable smoke even as uh, Antioch was um, just in terrible, terrible wildfire smoke and, um, and eventually got uh, hundreds of miles away. So really quite, um, quite a well-defined plume. And, and by using the visibilities, we were able to, to track that as it, uh, as it moved by. So here's what it looked like uh, 12.45 AM at Anvik. Um, visibility was reported by the, uh, by the FAA automated weather station at less than a quarter mile. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's like you're in a wood stove. That's how, that's what this was like. Um, um, even lower visibility than Nome got the following morning. Just incredibly bad. They had conditions like this for several hours. Um, and I should, this is at the level... Um, this is at the level that, uh, like the worst interior uh, wildfires um, uh, produced for, you know, that uh, uh, impact, you know, this is like 2004 in, uh, in Fairbanks. It's really extreme um, wildfire smoke. So um, morning of July 1st, I get up and like, oh my gosh, look what's going on. So I put together this collection of images here. These are all from um, around 6.55, 7 a.m. Um, all of this is smoke. I mean, one of the things about smoke, of course, is um, just if you don't know any, if I just showed you this picture, um, you at least the, the, the gnome uniclete in White Mountain, you might think, oh, it's just a foggy morning, no big deal. Um, but in fact, we know this is all smoke. At this time, um, you can see the smoke aloft here at Wales, here in the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand side here, and the sun right on the edge of this picture, this nice orange glow. Um, they would later get into this, um, this uh, denser smoke, but really quite amazing. Uh, it's big, you know, huge distance where we have all this smoke and very thick, acrid smoke. Um, so here we are uh, early afternoon. Um, the smoke is now into Wales. Um, starting to see a little bit thinner. I mean, the sun's higher too, but it was starting to thin out at this point at, um, at Uniclete, still quite thick um, here on the Seward Peninsula coast. Uh, by this point, it had overspread uh, the Seward Peninsula and was, at, as we'll see in a moment, um, was well into the Chukchi Sea, but really quite, quite remarkable. So um, thanks to everyone that um, gave permission to use uh, photographs here, lots of good uh, photo documentation here. Here's the gnome pics. Um, I love this one here. 
uh, from Betsy here of the hospital, and that's the sun. Um, that's a, you know a classic, classic uh, smoke picture. Um, really quite, quite impressive thick smoke. Again, if you didn't know anything, it looks like it's fog, but uh, uh, some of these, you know, you can really kind of, uh, especially if you lived it, you can almost taste that smoke in the air looking at these, uh, looking at these pictures. So uh, really, I'm glad that we got this kind of documentation uh, for this remarkable event. And here's a few more uh, from around the region. Um, classic smoke picture here uh, from, from Wales. Um, this is a little bit after that FAA webcam shot. Sun's a little bit higher, but you can see the orange glow and really the thick, thick smoke. Um, I love this picture here. It's a great one. Here's um, right at the mouth of the Unicleet River, um, really quite, um, quite dense smoke. And at the home office, um, immersed uh, in the smoke there on uh, the after that Friday, um, uh, what's that gay midday about? So, um, and of course, um, not just uh, smelly or, um, or low visibility, but um, of course had impacts here with um, bearing air um, canceling uh, flights um, due to the smoke. So uh, important, significant impacts for the region. And again, all from fires um, 400 miles away. So um, talked a lot about air quality. So I found this little graphic here um, and air quality is not something that we um, historically have had to, to worry too much about in, in Western Alaska, Bering Strait region. Um, winds keep things mixed up. Uh, unlike say, um, you know, the interior in the winter with strong inversions, inversions tend to not be as long lasting. Uh, in Western Alaska because of the wind. So um, air quality is generally better. So just your one slide uh, primer, uh, the um, uh, air quality, the, the um, 2.5 uh, um, uh, micron particles, that's, the, uh, that's basically the, the smoke particles um, from, com from fires. That, those are the most dangerous to human health. Um, they're tiny. Um, the little graphic here gives you an idea of the relative size. This, uh, this gray thing here is supposed to uh, represent a human hair. And so you can see these are much, much smaller than the diameter of a human hair, much, much smaller than um, fine beach sand. But these are, these are what's really uh, bad news for people's uh, uh, health, uh, breathing in this. Um, and one of the reasons that they're so dangerous is because of their tiny size, they can persist in the air for a long, long time. Um, it takes a long time to gra for gravity to uh, work those out. And so they tend to get cleaned out uh, by other mechanisms. But this is the, this is the size of particles that um, more frequently for Western Alaska will get smoke, of course, um, aloft. So those, those orange suns are not you know, not terribly uncommon. Um, typically, that comes from uh, wildfires in Siberia or Chukotka, um, occasionally from the interior, and even more rarely uh, from Seward Peninsula fires. But um, that's, that's the big health concern. The larger particles, the, the 10 micron particles, those are things like dust, mold, um, they can certainly be irritating. Um, you know, you're driving down the road and driving through uh, dust, uh, uh, kicked up uh, dust off the road. That can be irritating. But um, because they're larger, they um, travel much less, shorter distances and they spend much less time in the air. They're still small, but um, they, are, they are, don't last nearly as long in the air as um, the, the 2.5 uh, micron particles. So here is this, this is a, a visible satellite picture here. Um, not quite visible, it's a little bit enhanced, but I like this a lot from uh, the, about noontime on July 1st because you can really see uh, the smoke. At this point, the smoke is all the way across, it covers the entire Southern Chukchi Sea over the entire Seward Peninsula. Here's uh, clouds, but over Norton Sound, Starting to get it, there's a break here. Um, the smoke had moved past in somewhat clearer air here 
on the east side of the Nulato Hills. Uh, farther east, um, this is smoke uh, from other fires. But here over Western Alaska, you can really see um, the extent of this smoke. And this is uh, effectively 100%, maybe it's 98% from that uh, Cocktooley River, Pike Creek uh, fire. Uh, just a tremendous amount of smoke, very, very far uh, from the source. I don't, didn't measure it, but what the point hope um, must be what 650 miles uh, at least from that uh, from that fire. And there is there's the smoke. Really, uh, quite amazing. Now, um, these days we do actually have um, some uh, measurements of air quality, and this uh, 2.5 micron uh, uh, pollutant. Um, these are, we have two of them uh, that were relevant here in Western Alaska for this event. The, the one on the um, one on the left there is the measurement from uh, ANVIC. This was shortly after midnight, well, uh, 1252 AM on the first. Um, 1011 is actually probably above the measurement capability or, or reliable measurements from these, um, these uh, instruments, it, this is, means it's just, you know, extremely, extremely high. Um, Gnome uh, from the hospital here, uh, about 9.30 a.m., um, 701. For reference, um, that's higher than um, any of the sites around Fairbanks have gotten um, this summer. We came close on, to, on one day in some parts of town, but we didn't get that high. And as we'll see in a second, that wasn't even uh, the highest. But this is way up in the uh, in the wretched, uh, wretched air quality. Health warning of emergency conditions um, on the purple air site. So um, you know, on the site, they do let you grab the, the actual measurements here. And so I grabbed these for Gnome and Antioch and plotted them up here. And um, these, are, these are the raw counts and um, really shows the time series very nicely here. Uh, the purple is uh, ANVIC, and the red is from um, the hospital uh, in Nome. And so you can see, uh, you know, very, both places, this very rapid increase as that smoke plume came along. Um, the, and I should point out that, you know, most days in the summer, these values are very close to zero um, uh, in Nome. Um, so any, basically anything above zero is, is unusual. A little bit higher uh, on average um, in the interior, in the boreal forest regions, but you know, might, the typical value might be five or 10, something like that. So these really remarkable, remarkable values. Again, um, these values above a thousand are you know, just astronomically bad. Um, you can see that Gnome uh, was over the uh, was over the, the, if we use the 300 uh, micrograms per cubic meter level, that's the, that's a level for the very hazardous, we're over that from, from 6 p.m., or I'm sorry, 6 a.m. until um, almost 5 p.m. Long time in that really, really uh, thick smoke, even longer um, at Antioch, closer to, to the, um, closer to the fire. So really, I, I really hope that um, we don't uh, we, that we don't get to see this again. I really hope this is a one-off event. So um, both of these um, are coming from uh, these purple air air quality sensors. Um, there's a few of these around uh, rural Alaska. There's a lot in Fairbanks, where of course we deal with air quality issues both winter and summer. Um, but these are really interesting, um, really interesting. And um, there's actually a, a GoFundMe site uh, effort right now to raise money to install these in rural Alaska. Um, they're not very expensive. Purple Air is a private company. Um, one of these sensors is about $250. All you need is uh, some place to plug it in and a Wi-Fi uh, uh, connection that it can communicate with. Um, you, you, then you just put it somewhere outside and let it go. And they're quite robust. Um, folks in Fairbanks area have, have, them, have them outside and running continuously for, um, I've heard of at least four years now. 
and they're still going strong, so they're pretty durable. Um, now, these are the important thing from the air quality folks is that these are very different than the EPA uses. The EPA uses a completely different way to, uh, to estimate uh, these, uh, this uh, 2.5 micron uh, pollutant. Um, the, the purple airs are using a laser, basically a laser beam, and it's basically counting the number of hits it gets uh, for these, uh, for these uh, air, the, for the particle size that it's looking to detect. It also does this very frequently. Um, it's really completely different than the way the EPA standard historical sensors have done it, which basically involves having um, air blown through filters. And then um, periodically you weigh that to see how much has been trapped. Um, this is completely different. They've worked it though so that that while the process of gathering the information is entirely different, the values that are being reported are similar, if not identical, to what the EPA uh, standards would be. So um, uh, it's not the same. It is not what the EPA uh, way the EPA does it, but there's no reason to think that these are wildly um, different than, uh, than an EPA sensor uh, would have. Um, I highly encourage um, uh, if you're, this is something that you think you would be interested in, um, it's well worthwhile. And we definitely, this, you know, this event shows we need this kind of information uh, in Western Alaska. All right, so that's kind of what happened. So now is the, um, how did this happen uh, portion of the program. So um, June 30th, uh, the Coctuli River, uh, Pike Creek fires, uh, were just roaring. Um, the the if you were outside on on uh, July first, you were breathing in uh, material that 24 hours before had been uh, growing spruce trees. Um, the fire that the two fires there, that fire front burned about 75 square miles of boreal forest in 24 hours. Incredible, incredible burning. Um, I should say that that as at the moment, this 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 the Coctuli River and Pike Creek fires, which as I said, have burned together. They have burned now more than three hundred, or just about three hundred thousand uh, acres. Um, to put that in perspective, if you drew a line from uh, the mouth of the Sinook River to Cape Nome, and then drew another line from the mouth of the Sinook up to the Teller Road Bridge and connected that, that whole area, that's about the area that um, had these two fires have burned so far this season. And it's a huge area. This is the largest um, single uh, burn area in the state at the moment. So we had this incredible intense burning. At the same time, the weather ingredients came together, the same weather ingredients that were pushing this fire to the north with, with moderate but sustained southeast winds. Um, those winds were aloft and, and we had a weather front in the Bering Sea um, moving northward. You could see that the clouds with that in those satellite pictures. So we had southeast winds blowing from the fire right to the Seward Peninsula. And uh, those were southeast winds through uh, the lower portion of the atmosphere. Okay, so that got the smoke. We got these fires. We got the smoke moving to Norton Sound. Okay, that much I could understand uh, right away. But how did we get such dense smoke at the ground so far from the fires? And um, the key to that was a temperature profile in the atmosphere it was such that the most of the smoke got trapped in the lowest 5,000 feet or so of the atmosphere and was very, only very slowly mixing through that. Um, and that is the, that this, this last bullet, and we'll have a graphic for this, um, this is why really it got as utterly smoky as it did. This part, the Southeast winds in a, in a different temperature profile would have gotten known, you know, a, an orange sunrise, most of the smoke would have been aloft, yeah, a little bit of smoke smell, but probably 
um, no big deal, um, probably nothing that um, doesn't happen once every few years. It's this temperature profile that made it so awful. I uh, just wanted to show you this just to give you an idea of the intensity of the burning. Um, this is a this is a, um, a global product, and this is uh, uses both model and satellite information to get an estimate of the total uh, power, the total intensity of wildfires. And this is for Alaska uh, for each day of the season here. This goes through the seventh, but. What I want to highlight here is right here, uh, June 30th, July 1st, um, was a peak here. Uh, this was, an, uh, as you saw in those satellite pictures, most of the contribution of this is from those two fires. It's earlier in the month. This was from mostly from um, the East Fork and uh, Apun Pass fires, um, but the winds there were blowing out of the north to northeast, so other direction from, uh, from western, from the Seward Peninsula. Um, but really, uh, this is just illustrates how intense uh, the burning was on those two days. Now, here's the uh, here's the weather analysis there for um, this is for um, uh, this is for when is it the third? This is so this is in Greenwich Mean Time. This is midnight on Friday, so 4 p.m. Thursday, June 30th in Alaska. There's no here's this weakening weather front with this weak low here. Uh, west of um, St. Matthew Island. And this, so the southeast winds ahead of this, this was the key to transport the smoke from these fires on up towards the Seward Peninsula. But here's why it was so bad. So this is from the Nome uh, Weather Service, uh, the weather balloon launched at a um, uh, little after 3 a.m., so nominally 4 a.m., so uh, I'm going to spend a little time on this um, because this is a this is a technical uh, plot. This is a standard plot that meteorologists use to look at uh, temperatures and moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, but the the scale here is a little hard to understand if you're not used to it. The important thing that to know is that you'll see this this almost straight black line here. This is the temperature. Altitude is on the vertical axis here, but not the numbers here are the pressure, not the absolute height. The numbers here show the height above the ground. The important thing to know is this nearly straight black line that's, that's going from, from here, from lower right towards upper left, that's a, that's a, very, that's a standard decrease of temperature with uh, altitude. And in this, in this area here with this straight line, goes up to just over 5,000 feet, air would be mixing. The smoke would be mixing through that layer. But look what happens here, um, just above 5,000 feet. Instead of continuing up where my cursor is there, the, this, the temperature line goes almost straight. What this means is the air is cooling much less rapidly than it was down here. This this little, um, not quite an inversion, but this much more stable air here above, uh, above a little bit above 5,000 feet, this capped the uh, smoke in this lower layer. This, uh, this little cap here is associated with a layer of dry air here. This is, the, this is what's called the dew point, um, but you can think of this as, a, this is a proxy for uh, the humidity and where it goes way over here, this is a very dry layer. And it's this cap right here that kept the smoke in about the lowest 5,000, 6,000 feet. And that's why 430 miles from the fire front, Nome had such horrifically bad smoke. It wasn't able to disperse into the uh, middle layers of the atmosphere. It all got trapped um, near the ground. So really, um, this is the key to why it was so, so awful. Now, I should say that this particular profile, this isn't, this is not terribly common. It's no, this is not uncommon, especially with that approaching weather front. Um, there's nothing meteorologically unusual about this. Um, but it, once again, it's a, all the ingredients came together. We had the fires roaring, 
the transport from the fires to the Seward Peninsula, and then this little cap here um, kept the smoke all near the ground. All, any of those, if they, any of those had not been present, we would not have had um, Nome's incredibly smoky day. And um, of course, by the by the next day, um, that smoke plume had uh, mostly moved on by. Um, still looks kind of murky here, but of course that weather front had moved through and most of this is um, a good old fashioned um, fog, still some smell uh, lingering, of course. And um, like I said, uh, if you got any, got any clothing that was out in it, you might still be able to smell it. But the smoke plume itself um, continued off to the Northwest, eventually got dispersed um, somewhat, although we could track it for a long way. Uh, and um, conditions returned to more what we expect for, um, for Western Alaska in midsummer. So last slide I have for you, of course, uh, for me, um, since um, you know, I'm interested in it, well, the climate portion, has this ever happened before? And well, um, at least in one way it has, um, not this long distance uh, transport, but in the summer of 1977, it was a hot, dry summer. It was the big, big uh, wildfire year on the Seward Peninsula. More than 800,000 acres burned on the Seward Peninsula, um, much of that um, south of Deering and Buckland. And uh, on the uh, afternoon of July 31st, Nome was sitting at 84 degrees, near the all-time record high, when a wall of smoke moved in and dropped the visibility to a half mile. And um, that actually, the, the visibility of the smoke uh, moved in and out um, several times um, over the next couple of days. So Nome has had visibility at as low as we saw it on July 1st, um, but the only time I can find was this few hours on, in 19, uh, late summer 1977. And um, uh, Deanna Hacker at the Nugget uh, was able to pull out um, a couple of, nu of nuggets here on the impacts of this um, um, a wedding here um, uh, was um, impacted as folks could not fly uh, into um, uh, to uh, it was where was this at um, Pilgrim Hot Springs or up on the Pilgrim River um, to um, to attend this wedding. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, Deanna said this was the only um, mention she could find of this smoke event. Uh, in the nugget. Obviously, um, nowadays, if it got to 84 degrees and then got to half mile smoke, um, I think there'd be more coverage. We'd make sure of it. But um, so has this ever happened before? Has Nome ever had half mile visibility in smoke? Yes, but it was from very different situation. Fires were much, much closer um, than in this, uh, the July 1st event. So that's the entirety of what I have for you. Another, another great photo here. Um, uh, of the smoke. So, uh, Koyana. All right. Thank you, Rick. I mean, it's just awesome. You were able to quickly give us a uh, turnaround and give us such a great explanation of what happened. So before we have any questions, remember to give uh, Rick some love in the chat box for his great presentation. And are there any questions? All right, I've got one. So is the the purple air thing that is uh, that's at the um, hospital? Yes, that, that, that was. Is that the only one around? Um, that there's there's one at the hospital. There's one in Antioch. After the East Fork fire, um, somebody got one installed um, at um, St. Mary's. Uh, that is it. For uh, there's one at Ukiagwe. Um, but there's no other active ones um, on the Seward Peninsula or Bering Strait region. Interesting. All right. All right. And again, again I would, I, it's, we really need these, you know, Western Alaska, these events are not that common, but on the other hand, these instruments are not terribly expensive. If you've got a Wi-Fi network that you can hook up to, just plug it in, hook it up and forget about it. And it'll right. sit there and read good air quality most of the time. And then when something happens, it's there. Um, right. So um, 
it's and they're, and we know they're rugged. Um, if they can survive Fairbanks winters for four years, um, they should be good to go. Great. All right. Okay. Anybody question for Rick? You can unmute. People are too choked up. <laughs> They're still coughing. I don't know about anyone else on this, but um, I actually was shocked to see the hazard level. We all just continued about, there was no, no, I think the hospital shut down, but Northwest campus, everybody else just kind of bearing air stopped flying because they couldn't see, but we all, I eventually pulled out a mask because it was so irritating. Um, to my lungs and i thought well i just must be you know i don't know extra sensitive but i see your thing and i think holy cow okay i no wonder i was really feeling it coughing and yeah. not normally that choked up about smoke but um i felt that one and then my my other question is given that it was 400 and something 50 miles away has this, has this kind of long, you know, just this setup of the ingredients where the smoke can pop down on top of us so far away, is this something super unusual or is it we were just the lucky ones? Um, to, to, be, to be honest, um, I, I would never have thought that air quality could be that bad that far away. We certainly have seen you know, reasonably long distance transport resulting in very poor air quality in the interior, but we're talking, you know, 50 to 100 miles, um, not 400 at the, at the levels that we saw in Nome um, and the visibilities that we saw at all the FAA uh, automated uh, airport sites. Um, I would not have thought it possible that far from the source to get visibilities that low, to get air quality that poor. Um, Antioch, you know, within 125 miles of the, the fires, that, that, that was in the realm of, okay, I can, I can see that. But to get that so, so far from the, the source fires, um, I would not have thought that possible. But again, I it would just stress, it took all of these ingredients coming together, including not just a run of the mill wildfire, but this 40 mile fire front that consumed so many trees in such short order, just this intense burning, and then put it on a, put it in, basically put it in a box that, that uh, stable air aloft, squished that smoke into a box, and the winds moved it right along. All of those ingredients had to come together. Obviously, it can happen. Any given fire, any of that's, of course, unlikely to happen. But right place at the right time, or vice versa, uh, depending how you want to look at it. Right. And thanks, because your visualization, this presentation really made it even for someone like me who's not very weather uh, pressure, whatever. It was um, really great. I get it. The Dexter photo was at 5.45 p.m. I, had, I couldn't answer you. Okay. Right back. I had to, I had to um, look that up under properties, what that photo was. So um, 5.45 in the evening. And then Charlie says, really interesting. Seems like smoke in the past was from much closer and it sounds like that was the case. Charlie, are you talking about 1977 or, or something else? No, I, I was thinking um, more recently. I remember some, I guess, Siberian fires that were brought a lot of smoke to Nome. Um, yeah, yeah. Although not, I don't think, that to the, not to this level, I don't think. True. Yeah. I, I was, but they were, it was a smoky day or two. Yeah. But this, this took smoky day to a new level. Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I'll say so. It was thick. I thought it was fog when we woke up and then it was like, what the heck? You, you know, just looking out the window and then you open the window and you're like, I thought somebody was, you know, I, and I'm glad it turned out to be so far away. I was like, holy cow. Something's on fire really close. I mean, we're we better find out what's going on. But and, and that's the that's the normal, you know, 
who who would have ever thought that you could get like this from you know 400 miles away that it's just mind-boggling yeah so thank you so much hey wait a minute i have a question for rick oh go for it yeah hi rick good talk i liked it um so my question is most of these smoke events that we see, he, even here in Fairbanks, they're typically capped at what, 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet in that area, correct? Um, typ- typically for that really dense smoke, smoke um, there's gonna be a cap somewhere. Yeah, so it was just kind of fortuitous that you capped it at say 5,000 feet and then had the winds to put it in the right direction, right? It's a density layer just moving across exactly yeah. and and the you know the wind the the consistent wind level um let me see if i can go back to my oops sorry about that we go back here to the to the uh, balloon launch here so i the wind barbs here on the right hand side here this is the wind direction and speed yeah. and you can see southeast 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 they're they're southeast right up right far above the cap up to 20,000 feet. Just everything um, was in a line. Okay. It was all in a line. Yeah. And and because everything's in a line and you have this cap, so places like Bethel, far closer to the fire, they had no smoke at all. Um, because it was it was in this box and headed northwest. If the winds had been a little little uh, more variable, that that plume would have spread out more, but it didn't. All the ingredients came together. The the only way, now I know, um, and you know, the only way to get smoke this dense from that this far away from Nome is all these ingredients had to come together, every one of them. Take any piece away, and it wasn't a smoky day. Wow. Nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. All righty. Any other questions, kudos, comments, or recollections from the smoky day in July? I've learned a lot, and I just am so um, tickled, Rick, that you are kind enough to to think we're interested, and we are interested. So um, it makes a makes it very understandable. Hope we don't get another one. And um, Pete and Kate say, thanks, Rick. Great presentation. I hope this is the first of many clear days for you in air days for you in Fairbanks, because I didn't like that one, much less what you've been three weeks of it. Yeah, um, uh, we've had our share of smoke, uh, for sure. We're now, I think we're up to 437 hours of visibility reducing smoke. And that is now the second only to 2004 um since um 1952 so uh we have earned some clear air if i do say so myself (laughs) yes all right with that no other questions or comments um next week's straight science will be on wednesday not a thursday will be on wednesday the 20th and it's going to be uh bob bolton and katrina bennett they are with UAF. I, uh, I, they're with UAF and Los Alamos, and they are doing a project on the Seward Peninsula, looking at permafrost, vegetation, and moisture. And their ultimate goal is to tell us uh, in the next few years whether our habitat is going to be drier or wetter, and what that has in store for us. So that will be Wednesday night. So we'll be. Um, Jin and out the poster for that soon, and we hope to see you then.